passage I want to read is, um, is a very familiar passage. It's from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John. If you've done any research, any reading on the story of the woman caught in adultery, um, it was actually the Revised Standard Version, not the new Revised Standard Version that we use, that didn't include it in, the, in, their, in their translation because it, it's not in some very ancient manuscripts. It shows up later somehow. They don't know exactly when it got added to the Gospel of John, but it was included at a, at a later time, not a, at the earliest manuscripts. And so someone put it in John's Gospel for a reason. Listen for the Word of God from the eighth chapter of John. Then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All of the people came to him and he sat down and he began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand before all of them. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might make some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, I need help. What do I do now? Offering song. The message. Oh, it is the message. I'm sorry. I'm still working on my notes. Would you pray with me, please? Loving God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's an ancient tale about a beggar who approached one of the priests and asked him for some bread. The priest said, come into my tent and we shall eat together. So the beggar entered the tent with the priest and food was set out for both of them. Before they ate, the priest started to say thanks and praise God, but the beggar watched on in silence. When the priest was done, he looked at the beggar and said, why do you not praise God? And the beggar, beggar looked at him and went, why should I? What has God done for me? Why has he left me a poor, helpless beggar all my life? And hearing these words, the priest got angry and he picked up his staff and he started beating the beggar and beat him out of the tent and on down the road. And when the beggar was gone and the priest was getting settled, God spoke to him. And he said, why did you not feed the beggar? Why did you beat him? And the priest said, well, he was not praising you. And he felt very self-righteous in what he was saying. God said, this man has not praised me for 20 years and he is still alive. He has not praised me because all that time you have neglected him. He is only alive because I am less religious than you 
and I have not suffered him to perish. It seems to me, if I were as religious as you appear to be, there would be no one left on earth. This mythical story sort of points to a very uncomfortable truth that we all too often forget. Many years ago, Jonathan Edwards preached on a theme of sinners in the hands of an angry God. The thought was expressed by one person that he would rather be in the hands of an angry God than the, in the hands of his Christian neighbor who lived next door. People sometimes believe that simply because we call ourselves religious or simply because we go to church, we have automatically received a spirit of charity. Raymond Brown, who is a, a scholar on the Gospel of John, wrote the following about the passage I read of the woman caught in adultery. The delicate balance between the justice of Jesus in not condoning the sin and his mercy in forgiving the sinner is one of the great gospel lessons. Now this little drama that I read probably happened at a time when Jesus' popularity with the common people of the, of the day had intensified the hatred of the scribes and the Pharisees against him. And the Pharisees were looking for an opportunity to break Jesus' spell on the people. And they found it through this woman caught in breaking the, eighth com or the sixth commandment. And they brought her before Jesus with all their piety oozing out of every pore. And they cited the law of Moses. This woman must be punished by stoning her to death. And then they posed the question to Jesus. Teacher, what do you say about this? Now, before I go on, I need to apologize to all you women here because I'm not going to get into where the man was who was committing adultery with this woman. I know it takes two to tango, but the man is totally irrelevant, which may say something about men, but he's totally irrelevant to this story. The law is very clear. This woman was caught committing adultery. No one questioned that. And the answer, the response, the appropriate response of the law is to punish her by stoning her to death. This woman meant nothing to the scribes and the Pharisees. She's a thing. She's a tool to be used for their own purposes. This woman is a pawn in their game to try to destroy Jesus. And they are taking advantage of her guilt to further their own agenda. Through her, they hope to humiliate Jesus and lessen his popularity with the people. They didn't care about the people. They didn't care about this woman. They were interested only in themselves and that if that meant embarrassing someone to prove their own righteousness, then so be it. And you can almost sense that inward delight as they sneaked up on Jesus thinking, now we've got you. So how would you have answered their question? Maybe more to the point is how do we answer their question today? Would we have been one of the first to pick up the stone? Maybe we would just give this woman a stern lecture on the consequences of sin. Or given the popularity of it all today, maybe we would pull out our cell phone take a picture of this woman's predicament, tweet it all over cyberspace to make sure that we can share her embarrassment with all of our friends. We can be as cruel and malicious as the scribes and the Pharisee. The desire to make someone else look bad so that we look good is always with us. Why else do we take such delight in the misfortune of other people? I am continually amazed at how much time we spend tearing other people apart 
and how little time we take examining ourselves. This is why Paul wrote to the church in, in Galatia, my friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received God's spirit should restore such one in the spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. I dare say that this spirit of gentleness that Paul talked about is absent in much of our lives. And it has been replaced by a kind of pride which permits our need for self-justification to make others look worse than we do. And the good people of Jesus' day waited for an answer. They pressed him to respond. One of the commentaries stated that Writing in, a gra in the ground was a way of disengaging from the discussion or the debate. I know there are many people who have, who have tried to put their own words in what Jesus wrote in the ground, when in fact, he just didn't care. He wasn't interested in the discussion and the debate that the Pharisees were having, but they kept pressing him because they knew they had him. They knew he was going to be embarrassed and they would come out on top. Finally, he, Jesus stands up, he looks them in the eye and he says, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Now his answer is not some clever response or a slick evasion of an issue. Neither is he undermining the law. He is not saying that only those who are sinless can punish sinners. Jesus is taking on the zealots for the word of the law who have no sense of the spirit of the law. Had these religious leaders brought this woman to the ordinary courts, it would have been an entirely different story. She was guilty, and she would have received the proper punishment for her guilt. But they tried to sneak into God's realm under the guise of holiness. And they got an answer that they never expected. When Jesus said, you're right, she's guilty. Let the sinless one among you be the first to throw the stone. You see, God's realm is not a courtroom. God's realm is home. It is the place where we consider the log in our own eye before we start looking at that little splinter in our neighbor's eye. We have to remember that in God's realm there aren't labels like good and bad, guilty and righteous, sheep and goats. In God's realm there are only the guilty. As Paul wrote to the church in Rome, for now there is no distinction since all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Good people, especially good religious people, tend to forget that truth. And when we do, we run the risk of becoming like the scribes and the Pharisees, needing to prove our own righteousness, even at the expense of others. Now, having given his answer, silence fell upon this uncomfortable gathering. I, I can't begin to imagine what was going on inside this woman. Was she bracing herself for that first stone that never came? Was she, what, had she listened to what Jesus said and she's going, what was it? What was he really saying? Was he processing all that he said? For the only thing she could hear was the soft thump of the stones that were falling to the ground as her accusers edged their way through the crowd. Because with this sudden turn of events, they wanted nothing more to do with that nasty business. Martin Luther described their exit like this. They can look no one in the face, but must turn tail and sneak out of the temple, slinking out as a dog with a burned snout slinks out of the kitchen. Jesus is left alone with the woman. 
Now, now would be the perfect time for one of those great hellfire and brimstone sermon on the wages of sin. I'm sure you've all heard one of those before. But she's not in the courtroom. She's at home. She no longer faces the prosecuting attorneys, but she faces the Son of God who came to save the lost and the forgotten ones. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. Jesus looked at her and said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Jesus is not making light of her sin, nor does he deny her guilt. He's her savior and ours. And as I said with the kids, he removed her guilt. Not only is there great mercy here, but there's an incredible sensitivity and a beauty in how Jesus bestows his grace. We do not know what became of this woman. She is not heard again in the New Testament. But having been in her place, I choose to believe that she left with the hope of Jesus burning alive in her heart. Jesus looked upon her as a member of the family. God welcomed her home. So where do we live? In all honesty, I think we find ourselves in both the courtroom and at home. We live in a world of judging and being judged. To quote Luther again, let the stones lie. I will not pick any either. Let them lie. Do not throw them at one another. Drop the stones and say, forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Love the sinner? <laughs> you bet. That's how each one of us came to be here today. Hate the sin? You bet. But let me begin with my own first. It is then with the woman in our story and with all of the forgiven sinners of all ages and all places, we can rejoice together and praise God in Paul's word. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is important to remember that to the frightened woman, he said, go and sin no more. And to the righteous and the respected ones, he said, let those who are without sin cast the first stone. Grace is for all people trembling in their guilt. Praise be to God. Amen.